Welcome to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Gabriel Byrne is an Irish actor, film director, and film producer, a writer, and was named Ireland's first cultural ambassador. Gabriel has appeared in over 35 films, such as Excalibur, Miller's Crossing. You shouldn't be confronting Jenny Casper. That's what I've been trying to tell you. I can still trade body blows with any man in this town, except you, Tom. Little Women. Joe. Such a little name for such a person. You have me. The usual suspects. Close quarters, 10, maybe 20 men. Anybody goes in there is not coming out alive. Stigmata, End of Days, and The 33. He starred in the recent HBO series In Treatment. He co-wrote the 1996 film The Last of the High Kings. He's also produced films like In the Name of the Father, which was nominated for six Academy Awards. He was also the subject of the documentary Stories from Home. He's also a passionate advocate for accepting the reality of the existential crisis of climate change, and he fights to find effective solutions. And Gabriel Byrne now joins us in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. So on Reality Asserts itself, as m most of the Real News audience knows, uh, we start with your personal backstory, mm. and then we kind of get into what you think about stuff. Mm. Um, let me, for full disclosure, uh, Gabriel watches the Real News. He's donated a few times. And uh, so we're, we're, we're friendly here. Uh, but I'll see if I can't give him a bit of a hard time. <laughs> um, you grew up in a working class family in Ireland. And you once said, give me, give me a kid till he's seven years old, and whether it's the church or some uh, Americanism or, or fascism, uh, give me a kid till I'm seven, I got him forever. Um, well, the Catholic Church and Catholicism had you until you were seven. Um, uh, Irish nationalism, which is intertwined with Catholicism, in Ireland, had you till you were seven, and they didn't have you forever. So, so talk a bit about the sort of internalizing of the religion and growing up with such religious thought to the point that, you know, at 11 years old, you go off to a seminary on track to be a priest. Mm -hmm. Talk about that part of your life, and, and then we'll kind of get into how, how you break with that. Well, um I wasn't the one who said, give me a child until he's seven and he's... So you were quoting like, someone. Yes, it was the, the Jesuits, mm. uh, I think, who, who, uh, who came up with that one and how right they, they are about that. Because, of course, a child doesn't have the ability uh, to reason. That's why they say that when you get to the age of seven, that is, you have reached the age of, of reason. Up, up until that time, it's a form of inculcation, brainwashing, whatever you want to call it. But laid down in the teaching in those years is the notion of heaven and hell. And the, the idea of consequences for action, but also for thought. Um, you could go to hell for um, committing... Uh, an infringement against one's parents or the school or, 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 or whatever. And I remember once in a class, a teacher um, trying to relay to us the, the, the horrors of hell and the consequence of bad action. He took a kid from the front row and he struck a box of matches and he held a lighted match under the kid's finger uh, until the kid obviously, you know, grotesquely danced away in pain. Um, and the teacher said, this is what a, a, a hellfire is like, except that your entire body will be on fire and it will be for eternity. And he then went on to explain to us what the notion of eternity was. Uh, and to us at a very young age, he made us repeat again and again and again the word forever, 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 until the word made no sense. But you knew that there was this place of horror. Was he a priest? Um, no, he was a teacher. A, a teacher. And um, 
And so also on the other side, there was the notion of reward for good behavior, which was, which was heaven. So um, fear was laid down very early on um, in the way that y you, saw the, uh, you saw the world. And fear was a great way to make you conform. Uh, corporal punishment was endemic to the, uh, to the system. And uh, w we were beaten regularly uh, for all kinds of, uh, um, you know, supposed uh, m misdeeds. Um, cruelty and corporal punishment went together. And in a religious institution like the one that uh, I was taught in at the beginning, you had these celibate men and women who had total and utter authority over you. And in many cases, uh, they were extremely unhappy people who were forced into this condition of celibacy and were in charge of, um, in charge of children. How, how pervasive was sexual abuse in the school? Um, y you know, in the early years, I wasn't, I don't think anybody was aware of it. I mean, th th there were rumors here and there about people, but it was, we were too young to know what that actually meant. As we got older, of course, um, we began, the rumors began to be more uh, prolific. But um, I think the full horror of it didn't come out until we were adults and we looked back and thought, my God, that was part of what the system, of what the system was. And um, although you, you made a good point there that nationalism and Catholicism were kind of intertwined, and that's, and that's true, um, our, the way we learned history w w w was interesting. We learned it from um, an emotional point of view. Our enemy was England. Everything about England was, uh, was nefarious and, and, and evil. And we were very proud of the fact that we resisted the British uh, um, conquest for 500 years. But at the same time, we had a kind of a victim approach to history, that we were the victims of this um, appalling country that took it out on us for no reason whatsoever. And, and how much of your personal identity was your national identity? Well, the, the, the internalizing of Irish history was an emotional uh, experience. Um, so that there was, uh, in the teaching of history, um, a, a, an emotional um, element to it. Um, I mean, th th this was a country where heroes were people who died for the country. That was a thing that was, uh, among many people, aspired to the idea of being a martyr for your, uh, for your country. Those people were venerated. Um, Catholicism was unquestioned. Nationalism, to a great extent, was unquestioned. And you internalize those, th those things before you had a time to really think about them. So that um, when I came to 11 years of age, um, it didn't seem, although it does now, of course, it didn't seem strange to me to decide at 11 years of age that I would want to become a priest. That's what I was surrounded. In that spite was, of the corporal punishment. In spite of all that. Yes, in spite of all that, because also... Well, what were you getting at home? What, what did your parents do? And did they, were they, had bought into all this themselves? Did they challenge the, any of this in any way? Well, to say bought into it, it, it implies that in some way... I guess, yeah, it's the wrong word, uh, yeah, in, yeah. But, um, but they were immersed in the same yes, culture. They were immersed and because, be, because it was yeah. cultural. It, mm. it was social and cultural. I mean, the, the, the Irish word for church is tiach uh, and which means the, the house of the people. And so... Uh, uh, it, it was cultural and social as much as it was uh, religion. The idea of a God and heaven and hell were accepted w w without question. But there was a, there was a left in, in Ireland at the time, which was nationalist but not necessarily so religious, wasn't there? Or um, secular? I certainly didn't grow up with a sense of there being an oppositional force to it or, or, or there being a left uh, perspective. Um, we, we used to pray, I remember, uh, for the conversion of Red Russia. The teacher would stand up at the end and say, and now we'll say a prayer for the conversion of Red Russia. 
And we also had our own kind of colonialism, though we didn't see it as that. I mean, Ireland never invaded anywhere, but we would send out these missionaries to countries and uh, uh, to convert them to Catholicism because they were godless and had no direction in their lives, so they needed to be, needed to be saved. And, and that movement was supported by us at home in the form of uh, putting pennies uh, into a little box where there was a little b a black uh, boy who, who would nod his head every time you put in the every time you put in the uh, the coin, and that was for the conversion of their souls. So um, the emotional the emotional uh, nationalism that uh, that I grew up with. Um, um, and later came to see that we weren't exclusively the victims of Britain, but we were actually uh, part of uh, the colonial uh, empire, and that other nations also suffered um, like, like we did. I can remember my mother telling me that her grandmother saw people starving by the roadside in the Irish famine in, in 1845, where the population of the country went from eight million to four in the space of four years, and which uh, precipitated the, um, the huge immigration into, into America and Australia from, from Ireland, had a profound effect, not just on Irish history, but on, an America, on, on American history too. Um, and that's a, that was a huge psychic wound in, 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 in the Irish uh, soul. And people remembered it, and they remembered injustice, and they remembered the rising of 1916. Um, I came when, you know, when I went to England when I was in my 20s to become an actor. Um, I had the real sense for the first time of the, f uh, of the fact that I was Irish. I didn't ever question my identity, my national, my, 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 my Catholicism, really, until I went to England. Because at 11 years old, you go to a seminary mm. that's in London? That, that, that was in England, yeah. And any doubts? Or you are a full true believer at, still at 11? Well, I think when you're... Wh and, and let me add, as, I mean, some of the abuse that happened in the school you were affected by, mm -hmm. but at 11 you're still headed towards being a priest. Yeah, um, because I think that when you are, um, well, I don't want to use the word brainwash, but certainly when you're inculcated with certain notions about the way the world operates, it's not, it's not that I sat down and said, hmm, I wonder should I, it seemed like a natural extension of the life, the society that I lived in. But there were a lot of people, <coughs> not a lot, the vast majority of people that grew up in that culture don't become priests. They may go to church, they may be true believers, true. but they don't pick the path of that. True. Is that, was it, from, did that get partly inspired from your family or your own internal thing? I, I want to be a priest. Yeah, I th you know, I think it's, it's, it's got complex roots. Um, the, the, I, I became an altar boy first. And that, I suppose, was my first introduction to theatre, because the, the, the church and the theatre are not far apart. If you look at the, the way a church presents its rituals, it's, it's very deliberate. I mean, you have a stage, which is the altar, you have the leading actor, which is the priest, you have stained glass, which produces a certain effect. It's all theatre. You, you, it's all theatre. Incense, which is a soporific effect. Um, Even the, this enormous church with all yes, the it's meant overpowering to architecture. Power. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I was just noticing that when I came into Baltimore uh, oh, yesterday. A lot of churches here, and and this and was the, this Baltimore was the Catholic city versus yes, New York. Uh, yes, and 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 the prominence of that architecture in the community. Every every village in every town in Ireland has a church, but <coughs> I um, I um, became an altar boy, and the congregation, the audience, it was all very similar. And I think there must have been something in me that was attracted to that, even though I'm an extremely shy person and was then uh, crippled with shyness. But yet I had this compulsion to be doing that. Uh, I don't know why or how that um, manifested itself in... What is your... 
internal conversation with God at this time? I mean, you're praying. It's a real thing in your mind. Mm. Well, it was a personalized God. Um, it, it, the idea of it being a force, uh, you know, or an invisible spirit, or, uh, it wasn't that. It was actually a physical person in a physical place. So that when you thought of God, you, you thought of uh, a, a, an old man with a white beard. In fact, there was a guy who used to live on the street next to us who had a white beard, and his nickname was Holy God. But you, you know, because that, that image of God, that personal image of God, and the reality of a place called heaven to a child um, was um, deeply reassuring. Uh, because I think that one of the one of the powerful things that religion gives is a sense of reassurance and security, and that you know the the answers to extremely complex questions uh, are in many cases simply laid out. So my my relationship to God at that time was a child's uh, relationship. And the religion itself had the uh, had the the magnetism for me of of a fairy tale, and um, there's an element of the fairy tale in in the religion anyway. And so, the greatest gift that could be bestowed on a, on, a, on an Irish Catholic household was to have a priest in the family. And there are families where there are priests and nuns and several of. It, N not anymore because vocations have fallen off hugely, but... Um, but it would have made your family proud. Very proud, yeah. And I, I, I thought in my child's way that it gave me tremendous reassurance that there was somebody up there, a, a powerful paternal figure who was taking care of me and that I could talk to uh, in, the, in the form of prayer and that I could try to live a good life uh, w with his help. What did your father do and mother do? Uh, my father was a, a laborer, and um, he was uh, he worked in Guinness uh, Guinness's brewery, the famous uh, um, Irish brewery, and he was made redundant at fifty years of age. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, s somewhat cruelly, but at the same time in a, in a childish way. Well, he's so old anyway, he's 50. I mean, what does he care about going to work? But it's only later I reflected on the absolute injustice of what happened to him and people like him in that their identity as working class men was bound up in the work that they did. And when they got to be uh, um, 50, they were just thrown on the scrap heap. There was no, they got a pension, a small pension, but their worth as human beings uh, plummeted to the point where I'm sure they had appalling days and nights of, of, of suffering because they were no longer the breadwinner. My father used to come in on Friday evening with a little brown envelope and he would put it behind the mirror and my mother would take it out and give him back his money for his drink and his cigarettes and his tobacco or uh, whatever. And that was no longer the case, and the roles became reversed, and my mother went out to work. What did she do? She was a nurse. So she, she worked the night shift, and uh, my father took care of us, six of us, uh, during the daytime. And um, I remember my father, that sense of, because associated with unemployment was this notion of shame, that somehow it was your fault. And so I, know, I, knew, I knew he carried, though I couldn't articulate it really at the time, I knew he carried like an invisible hump on his back, this sense of failure and shame. And he tried to do other jobs, but nobody would employ him. And um, he, di he died at a relatively uh, young age. And I think a great deal of that had to do with How the fact... He? he was 60, 66. About where you are now. Yeah. And um, he believed all his life. He went to Mass every single morning. How, how much did you share <coughs> your, your internal life with either of your parents? Especially when you started having some doubts about the path you were on. Mm. I, I, I think the culture of the time, I, I'm not sure uh, what it was like here, uh, but in Ireland 
the idea that parents and children would sit down to discuss an internal life was kind of... I remember there was a, an American television series that was beamed into us in, in Ireland, ludicrously uh, opposite to the kind of experience that we had. It was called The Brady Bunch. I don't know if you remember yeah, sure. Yeah. But we used to look at this. We'd all be sitting around in the sitting room on two or three chairs. You know, uh, I don't want to make a Frank McCourt situation now, but it was, you know, it, it wasn't l luxurious. And we'd be watching this thing called the Brady Bunch, and they had a maid who, who poured orange juice for them before they went to school. And the father would say, okay, kids, let's have a meeting. And I would look at this and I'd say, this thing isn't funny. Why, 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 why is everybody laughing at this thing? And these kids were saying things like, oh yeah, I, I have a crush on this girl at school. And kids went to mixed schools for a start. They were able to say to their parents, I had a crush on this. And they were incredibly happy because they had everything. It looked to me like um, a, a, an unattainable ideal. And it, what, what, what was really being shown there was to a certain extent, the American dream. And the American dream clashed with Dublin working class uh, reality. And you just looked at this thing and you said, my God, there are people who live like that. But that's what America is. Everybody in America lives like that. You, you mentioned at, in school you would pray for the conversions of the Red Russians. Um, how, you, this is, you're growing up during Cold War years. Mm. Uh, and both the American-Russian <laughs> rivalry, the potential of nuclear war, mm. uh, certainly in this country, you know, relentless propaganda against anything left, anything yeah. secular, anything that even quasi-socialist, never mind communist, yeah. uh, and a purge of the left in many in state institutions in Hollywood and such. Mm -hmm. How much is that Cold War ideology part of what you grew up with? Um, I remember those that um, the incident of the Bay of Pigs and the world being brought to the edge of a nuclear war. And suddenly the world started to get really small because um, we lived in Ireland and that was the world to us. And suddenly there was the possibility of annihilation because these two people were doing what? They were having some kind of a row. And we were all, and I remember watching this in, they used to put television sets in windows of shops. And we were all gathered around this window uh, of the thing, watching some kind of a discussion or a program about Kennedy and Khrushchev. And I didn't understand it at the time. And I was looking in the window and this guy was saying, well, that guy, that guy is Khrushchev. And, he, and that guy, Kennedy is the good, the good guy. This guy is the bad guy. And Kennedy's going to stand up to him. But if they attack America, the entire world is going to be blown up and set on fire. You're it's, about 13 or 14. Yeah, suddenly, suddenly the world became a very terrifying, uh, terrifying place. Kennedy was deified in Ireland because, of course, he had Irish-American roots. And th th there used to be in Ireland a very common thing, which was <clears throat> a picture of the Pope looking one way and Kennedy looking the other way. And sometimes Jacqueline Kennedy, Onassis, until she married, uh, I mean, until she married Onassis, then she was taken out. But the Pope and Kennedy were the two kind of like earthly gods. So Kennedy could do no wrong. And <clears throat> in fact, he came to Ireland to visit, uh, but six months before he was uh, assassinated. And they talked about him in the sense of, our boy has come home. You know, the, 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 the Irish uh, grandfather who left Wexford with nothing and then achieved the American dream and his son beca grandson became president and all that stuff. So um, I, I think after that, I was never as secure about the world. That went really deep. In the next segment of the interview, uh, we're going to explore uh, Gabriel's next phase uh, as he starts to break with some of the uh, both nationalist and Catholic religion that he grew up with. 
and uh, I, I don't know if I'm overstating it, but you know, sort of a coming to a political consciousness that uh, starts to question and challenge many of those assumptions. So please join us for the next segment of our interview with Gabriel Byrne on Reality Asserts Itself.